Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Teaching Games for Understanding book launch. Um, we have our very sort of nice book here. Oh, you can't see it all that well because of my background. But uh, I will put the uh, link to the book in the chat for you later. Uh, the sort of structure of this webinar is going to be um, a little bit of an introduction from my fellow co-editors, Shane and Linda. Um, and then we are going to hear from uh, some of our contributors, Michael Davis and Adrian Turner, as well as Shane and Linda for their contributions um, to the book as well. Um, at the end of all of that, we are then going to pass it over to any of you attendees. If you would like to ask any questions, um, please feel free to put them into the chat or you are free to speak at sort of the end and have that dialogue towards the end of this uh, sort of webinar. Um, so I'd like to thank you all for attending and also to a huge thank you to all of our contributors to the book. Um, it's been sort of a, a long process, but sort of one of a labour of love um, to be able to produce this book in terms of our 40th anniversary celebration, looking at global perspectives, research perspectives, and also looking at future directions. Where do we see ourselves in 10, 15, or even 40 years time? So I sort of want to pass over to Linda and Shane uh, to give their sort of thoughts in terms of the process and sort of what went well and didn't go so well in terms of our book. So Linda and Shane. You want to go, Shane? Go ahead. Well, it uh, came out of the 40th anniversary celebrations of the 1982 publication of the uh, research that Loughborough University, David Bunker, Rod Thorpe and others who were there at the time had been doing with schools on a new approach to games teaching and that new approach has eventually become known as Teaching Games for Understanding. We were thinking that in the 40 years since then, there have been developments, there have been questions, there have been identification of things that uh, were perhaps part of the original TGFU project that weren't fully explained or missed out on being explained, that have been added to by models that owe their lineage to TGFU, such as the tactical games model, my own work with Play With Purpose, the Game Sense approach in Australia. And so it was timely to update the field on the developments that had occurred in the 40 years since that 1982 Bulletin of Physical Education, while also paying respects and homage to that, that seminal piece of work that has influenced so many of us in our games and sports teaching and sports coaching since then. Over to you, Linda. Yeah, wow. <laughs> that kind of sums it up, but it was, it, it is, it is, it marks a really a critical time, I think, for the special interest group and uh, the, in quotes, movement across the world. And I think that's one of the benefits of this book, that it gives a world per perspective, which is where we are right now with the, I mean, the one thing that this pandemic has given us is the opportunity to be with each other across the world in a way that we hadn't done before. And this brings this all together to, to, to celebrate it's like retrospective, but it also gives us perspective to move forward. And I, I think that that was a good thing to have, particularly during this, um, the pandemic era, to have a way to connect with all of the organization of Ellen's um, webinars and then to have this be sort of a culminating activity within the, within the group. So yeah, it was just great, great project. And uh, thank you to all the authors for giving their perspectives, which helps our our growing perspective in the next 40 years. So thank you. So uh, if um, the sort of start of the book, we sort of discussed there in terms of the introduction um, and Shane's sort of chapter one, where we explore the history of game-based approaches, looking at those developments from Malden and Redfern in 1969 through to sort of the 1982 publications um, and subsequent kind of work from key um, sports pedagogists in the field who have then sort of developed and helped sort of get us through what is game-based approach has formulated what this sort of looks like, this, this structure that we now have. 
And we've gone through and talked a little bit about what these key developments have caused. Of course, we have the uh, TGFU SIG, uh, the formation of that courtesy of, sort of Joy Butler at our international conferences, our task force group, which then later became the SIG. We also have discussed some of those key developments in the field, looking at assessment tools. Um, we've focused quite heavily on equality and diversity and inclusion. Uh, we've looked at other sort of links with different ideas, for example, the sport education model or uh, the spectrum of teaching styles. We've got this sort of progression of development through over the past 40 years, and I think it's worked really well. And like I say, we're linking some of the webinars that we did last year to show that progression of how we've gone from sort of the start of game-based approaches to where we are today. Um, so I think that's been quite wonderful. And then Shane's sort of first chapter discussing the model and um, do you want to talk a little bit about that, Shane? Yeah, happy to. That was a, a lovely chapter to be part of. Sarah Doolittle was there uh, in the 1980s working with Rod and David and, and the others who were taking the model out to school, exploring its impact with the teachers in the schools and reflecting on it. And then when she went back to the United States, she brought the, uh, the ideas with her and was researching and writing about it. So to get her retrospective memories and thoughts on the impact on her work but more broadly the impact of TGFU on the field of games and sport teaching was really important in my opinion to capture and then from the Australian perspective Rick Baldock was working at the Australian Sports Commission when Rod was uh, in Australia. Uh, Rick has the memory of actually taking Rod around Canberra and showing him the sights and uh, like Rod um, he shares a passion for tennis and so Rick's retrospective um, memories of the developments leading into the Australian Sports Commission wanting to pursue a new vision for games and sport teaching, particularly for children and youth, was important to capture because it was a story that hadn't been told in the sequence that Rick was able to tell it. So from a historical perspective, Sarah and Rick provide really good contextual information um, that's captured for the first time. And it's really great to see those sort of anecdotes, that behind the scenes sort of development that we don't normally see in terms of um, other books and uh, research articles. It's nice to see that personal story that has helped shape their practices as well as the field of game-based approaches. Um, we have one of our um, authors with us, so Adrian Turner, um, and I'd like to pass on to Adrian to let him talk a little bit about his chapter within that book. Okay, uh, thanks, Ellen. Uh, hopefully everybody can see the screen uh, in front of you there. And I'd just like to um, give somewhat of a little formal overview of my book. Hello to everybody, wherever you are, whatever time zone. Um, so I wanted to uh, spend a little bit of time talking about the chapter. Um, first of all, like many of us, I'd experienced physical education as sport techniques um, when I was uh, a kid sort of growing up. And um, I learned about really teaching games for understanding as an undergraduate in the UK in the 1980s at Exeter University. I experimented with um, specifically teaching games for understanding my secondary teaching in the UK. Um, but it was really I, I sort of began my study and the, my work into that area when I came to the US. And I worked with um, Tom Martinick at the University of North Carolina, Greensboro. And um, Tom actually has just retired after 47 years at UNC Greensboro, so a very long and distinguished career. My work with him was based really in um, sort of a scientific movement, um, objective testing, mathematical procedures to solve different types of educational problems. And really in those days, and I understand things have changed a little bit now, um, it was sort of experimental studies that were undertaken um, were looked at to produce the sort of um, soundest evidence pertaining to different types of cause effect relationships. So really it's within that backdrop, um, I suppose that um, I would look at our sort of um, uh, studies that took place in the US. Um, they were predominantly, as I said, in North America, games-based approaches versus different types of technique teaching. 
Um, and really there was a variety um, of studies that were undertaken using a sort of comparative model. Um, those studies took place in uh, different invasion sports, um, soccer, field hockey, and then basketball, and then also um, in net and wall games. In fact, uh, Linda Griffin was one of the people who undertook one of those particular uh, studies that undertook and took place. Um, all of those studies utilize different types of um, assessments. Some of them were sport technique or uh, technique-based assessments to measure uh, the differences between the games-based approaches and the technique-based approaches. Um, measures also looked at different types of knowledge. And then um, game performance variables were varied, uh, were measured on some different um, uh, uh, protocols, one of those being the game performance assessment instrument. And that particular instrument um, looked at not only um, a sort of on the ball decision making, but also off the ball movement as well. So there were basically some um, fairly sort of uh, uh, formulated uh, dependent measures that were looked at to measure uh, really performance of the two um, different approaches. Um, the findings from many of those studies were somewhat equivocal, and um, you can read the details about the uh, sort of nuanced interpretations and results from the different research that took place in the chapter. But I wanted to sort of highlight a couple of things that I think are quite important uh, in terms of maybe uh, attempting to explain that sort of variability. One of the elements was that we had really uh, multifarious types of research designs um, and different interpretations of game models. So for example, there was a tactical games model as well as teaching games for understanding. Um, in most instances, those game-based approaches were for a specific period of time. The comparison took place over a period of time. And um, Miller's review in 2015 suggested that um, you need a minimum exposure of eight hours uh, in order to try and find some sort of uh, distinction between the two models. In other words, a time interval that's less than that is not gonna have an effect or a treatment effect that goes on as part of the process. Uh, various types of validation protocols also were utilized, but some of those really didn't measure the type of teacher intervention that was going on very well. And that's been re reported more recently in reviews that have done studies of that period of time. Also, we found uh, that inexperienced instructors sometimes tinkered with a teaching games for understanding approach. And because of that, uh, there was in some instances, uh, treatment diffusion that took place, uh, as well as pretest sensitization as well to the ensuing treatments that were, were undertaken. So um, one of the things that was attempted in that period of time was really to restrict some of the threats that um, were basically to the validity of those different types of studies. So for example, in the work that Tom and I undertook, we attempted to negate a potential teacher effect by using multiple teachers. In other words, having different teachers use both technique and games-based approaches, rather than having one teacher teach only with one approach. And then also uh, the reason why we and our studies undertook field hockey was because we were trying to negate any prior experience which could potentially interface with the different types of uh, teaching that the students were um, understanding. Um, one of the issues that we sort of got into with trying to undertake testing within a sort of scientific paradigm and comparing the two models is that um, one of the things you're attempting to do is um, basically in the comparison to control the teaching environment. But because you're attempting to control the teaching environment, it's much more difficult to make generalizations to pedagogical practice, which is actually taking place in school-based physical education and sport coaching contexts. So as a result of that, um, you almost run into what might be referred to as a catch-22 situation. Um, one of the areas, an example of that would be, we typically use quite small teaching groups because we were trying to utilize game-based approach in fairly small instructional space. One of the things that's been shown, particularly with invasion sports, is that you need time and space in order to try and develop more skillful gameplay. You can slowly restrict that space, 
over a period of time. But in the real world, and this is often the case in physical education here, particularly in the United States, there are real space restrictions on the physical, on the physical activity environment. And potentially that will have a greater impact on games-based approaches rather than say, for example, technique teaching. So that's almost an alternative explanation as to why sometimes teachers will utilize technique-based teaching as opposed to games-based um, approaches. Games-based approaches also require a greater demand on teacher subject knowledge. And that teacher subject knowledge um, goes beyond sort of basic understanding of common content knowledge of rules, tactics, and skills. It also incorporates specialized content knowledge when you're basing that on the development of game progression and particular types of tasks to teach tactics and skills. In games-based approaches, you need a great deal of that um, specialized content knowledge in order to teach effectively. It's one of the reasons why very often teachers, uh, initial level teachers and student teachers will prefer to go to a technique-based model than a games-based approach. However, in the comparative paradigm that we used and the other research that took place during that time period, very often teachers, uh, while they were equipped with specialized content knowledge, didn't really have the pedagogical content knowledge. That's the comprehension of students' needs, their prior learning, and then the learning context uh, wasn't really accounted for in the curricula that was set up for those comparative types of studies. And so this also uh, was potentially a detrimental effect to the results of that type of work. Studies more recently looking at teaching games for understanding in more naturalistic types of settings highlight the need for that pedagogical content knowledge in terms of being able to plan and teach game tactics and skills. Um, the ecological validity of technique approaches versus games-based approaches was also questioned by some fairly eminent scholars. For example, the late Mike Metzler once said that really comparing technique to a games-based approach was like comparing apples to oranges. Um, and as a result, there was a movement uh, beginning in the early 2000s to using more of a practice referenced or teaching experiment type approach uh, to indicate uh, really the, uh, the model um, being looked at more in schools as opposed to uh, a more decontextualized type of context. However, um, the comparative investigations still continue to take place. Um, and some of them have been um, described as much higher in terms of the ecological validity of, those different, of that different type of work. So, for example, um, communities of practice have been formed to enhance pedagogical uh, content knowledge in reference to games-based type of instruction. Um, a meta-analysis looking at studies from 2006 to 2018, also utilizing analysis of the technical versus tactical paradigm, showed that the tactical approach did, in lead, uh, did indeed lead to improvements in different game decision making. We also know students have increased increase uh, interest and motivation as a result of the games-based approach, as opposed to a technique uh, instructional um, mandate. So uh, comparative studies um, can also provide, um, I guess, in, in sort of uh, scientific terms, a little bit more statistical significance. They have a little bit more statistical power than let's say, for example, looking purely um, in a teaching experiment type situation uh, that was advocated um, by many scholars previously. So um, just, and I understand I've given you a little bit of a, a quick tour here of my chapter in terms of looking at the technical versus tactical paradigm. Um, I would say that um, the work that was undertaken in those initial years in the 1990s in particular was really an attempt to help TGFU and games-based approaches in general gain a little bit of legitimacy. And the approaches were measured, obviously, on skill, knowledge, and then game performance and affective variables as well. Uh, the chapter that I wrote doesn't address the affective domain, um, but focuses a little bit more on those other areas. The danger, of course, and this is pointed out by um, a scholar unrelated to physical education, but one who is very well known in the United States, um, Brene Brown, she argues that if you are utilizing comparison, it's helping to show your model, well, perhaps not only fit in, but it's also trying to get it to stand out. Comparison really says, be like everybody else, 
but be better. Unfortunately, one of the dangers with that is that that can also stifle creativity. And that is something, of course, that games-based approaches in general have attempted to uh, afford uh, plenty of opportunity for. So games-based approaches from the uh, comparative technical versus technical paradigm notion offer a viable alternative uh, to technique-based instruction. And the chapter sort of provides an overview of those different types of elements. Um, I can talk a little bit more, Ellen, if you want, but I'd like to stop there um, because obviously there are there are plenty of other people who, who um, you know, want to contribute. Yes, thank you for that, Adrian. Um, we can come back to it in terms of the question and answers if you want to add any more sort of last minute comments towards the end. Um, if you are interested in Adrian's chapter, it's in the uh, section two of our book on research perspectives. Uh, it's chapter eight. Uh, entitled The Tactical versus Technical Paradigm, Scholarship on Teaching Games with a Catch-22. Uh, so it's there for you if you would like to have a look. Um, I would also now like to sort of pass on to uh, Michael, uh, who also contributed a chapter. So Michael, would you like to say a few words about your chapter? Thanks, Alan. I will quickly just bring up what I was going to share. Okay, so the chapter that I'm going to talk about is chapter 17. Um, I did this with collaboration with Associate Professor Shane Pill, who's also in this session, as well as Professor John Evans. So I wish to acknowledge them and I'll mention a few others as I go along. This chapter um, is came about from the discussion um, after the 40th anniversary presentation last year um, where Alan um, invited me to uh, I write a chapter based on the work that we had presented and I'm going to give a snapshot of that just based around decolonizing physical education using a game-based approach as I'm based in Australia that is using um, the game sense approach and I'll touch on that a little bit more as well. I wish to acknowledge that the university that I'm associated with being the University of Canberra is on the land of the Ngunnawal people. Um, when introducing myself and saying hello, Yuma or Yama, um, depending on the pronunciation around Australia, is how we say hello here on Ngunnawal country. When we talk about uh, physical education in many colonised um, uh, nations, countries around the world, as a historical lens that we can look at that and the role that games play um, and sport within that provide a context to discussion around um, where we have avenue to um, build upon what has been existing in those places. So for example, the picture that's depicted here is um, the possum skin ball called Marangup, which in the middle of the picture, you can see um, that game being played, which is actually um, a contentious one, but has been um, the story behind the national game in Australia, the Australian rules football, um, born out of that particular Indigenous game. And so there's, um, I'll allude to that as to why that's important when we talk about different types of pedagogy. The other thing to mention is that the role of education in that space to shift that discourse is really important. So how we can meaningfully um, engage our students in physical education in an inclusive way without appropriating culture. And that gives us opportunities to embed new ways of knowing, being and doing in how we may teach physical education. It's important to note though, that when we're doing that, it's beyond just perspectives and tokenistic measures of just content and um, facts and that sort of thing, historical artifacts. And it's about how we teach. So this is the purpose of this chapter is discussing an indigenous Australian um, lens to how we um, could go about that. This is something that Martin Nakana refers to as the intersection between Western and Indigenous domains or the cultural interface. And there's a really fantastic paper there, um, which still is very current in terms of talking about that, that interface. The acknowledgements that I want, were mentioned earlier, so Shane and um, John Evans, 
uh, two main contributors to this space. There's also um, Associate Professor John Williams, who's second from the right up the top there, and Ken um, Edwards, who's on the far right, have played pivotal roles in Australia in terms of how we look at Indigenous games and use that in physical education that's beyond just playing the game and how we actually might embed that in a, a meaningful way that is going to continue culture into the future. So I wish to acknowledge that. And that's where this work was built upon um, from a number of different papers. So what we've been proposing, um, and it's important to note that the educators um, that have, and the researchers as part of this team, um, John Evans is our Indigenous um, uh, knowledge holder, um, Indigenous man who provides, uh, I guess, the cultural background. Shane, Pill and myself come to this discussion more as the pedagogy experts um, and how we can find that intersection that Nakata was talking, talking about. So John pr provides his context to where that intersection may take place from an Indigenous lens and vice versa from a Western lens from Shane and myself. So what we, what we propose is a way, but it's not certainly the, the way when it comes to embedding um, Aboriginal pedagogy into the curriculum. The, the lens that we have chosen, um, because there are many different ways that we can embed this within the curriculum and, and in different places in Australia, this one of the eight ways which um, Yunker Porter, Tyson Yunker Porter had put forward, is finding this common ground between the difference gap that we can see when it comes to knowledge in the space of referring to this in education, physical education, it's trying to find common ground in what that might look like. So what we put forward in a paper um, that was released in 2020, 2021 was around this games for sport. So how can we use games and sport in physical education to provide opportunities and what are the pedagogy that we might use? So in our context in Australia, a game sense approach was appropriate and the eight ways pedagogy, which I'm gonna just give a little snippet of what those are. And we unpack that across the chapter as to what those eight ways are, where the overlap and I guess um, complementary aspects. So it's not just saying we now use the game sense approach and just tack on the eight ways. It's finding the synergy between those two different types of um, knowledge systems and bring them together. And we give some examples across the chapter. And so these are the eight ways, um, and I will just speak to these briefly now. So the first one is story sharing. It was really nice to hear Shane at the start of this session give context to the purpose of this book. And I think at times we forget to tell the story when, it, when we're talking about sport, whether that's a, a Western sport or from different cultures, because it really brings that sense of belonging and continuation of culture. And that story sharing is very much embedded in inquiry-based learning. And so that is the, the first of the eight ways is how we might embed that within a game sense approach and use story sharing as part of the learning. The next one is learning maps. So pathways of knowledge are inherent in any game or sport. We think of the game sense approach, invasion, net court, strike, fielding and target all have their own intuitive lenses that we can use and students are trying to, in this particular eight way, make their learning visible. So how they might picture the game and actually bring that to life um, in a visual way. Land links, this is a really important one when we're talking about Aboriginal pedagogy. And this is because of the strong connection to country, country as teacher and developing those relationships where students can share those stories about place and therefore give back to the place that they live, um, but also learn on. And that is really important given that the learning has taken place on this country in Australia for tens of thousands of years. And so the emphasis therefore is about the local context, learning from that local place and then continuing that knowledge. The nonverbal is the next one referring to how we might use that in the game sense approach is talking about this hands-on with minds-on, building thinking players, using critical reflection and making it more student-centered. So the teacher is stepping back and providing agency for the students and bringing the opportunities for that visual story, symbols and images, and how we might use that again to represent learning within tactics and strategies. 
symbols and images goes just not just beyond in terms of maybe gameplay, but also how we might use them as building blocks for memory and making of meaning, um, which is very intuitive for an Aboriginal pedagogy. Um, and there's opportunities there within the game-based approach to bring in different symbols, which we not often do do, but do it in a much more explicit way. Got a couple more and then I'll wrap it up there. The next one is non-linear. So this is describing how the game sense approach and Indigenous pedagogy is not so much in a linear progression, but more in a flexible, dynamic way. That's not sequential and it's more in a cyclical way. So if we think of time, for example, we have past, present and future, um, and they're all connected. So from an Indigenous perspective, there's the notion of we need to think more rounded rather than working in steps. And that's what people here in this session would appreciate in too, in terms of learning is much more than A, B, C. It is um, a very much a non-linear approach, which the game sense approach also speaks to. As a result of that, we can just de um, uh, deconstruct and reconstruct the way that we introduce students to games and um, stepping away from the whole part of the game into modified versions, back into the parts and practicing those. And again, that speaks to that Indigenous way of learning. And the final one is finding community links. So one of the questions that was posed in the chapter is how will students transfer their learning to affect students' future for their greater community? So what is the sense of obligation and the custodianship? So, you know, this, this book, I think, is very much speaking to that around that stewardship. Um, what has gone before and what can that carry on going forward. And I think this chapter speaks to that as well and giving some examples in a practical sense. So if you want to learn more a little bit about how we unpack this, um, there's obviously the chapter in this book and refer to the article as well that we spoke to this in, in greater detail. And that's me. Thank you very much. I'll hand it back to you, Alan. Thank you for that, Michael. Um, if anyone is interested in this chapter, it's an absolutely fantastic one. Um, it's in our Future Directions, Section 3, uh, Chapter 17, Decolonising PE Using a GBA. It's sort of a wonderful, um, and I'm quite happy that we've been able to add this into our book. It's something that is very much coming out a lot more in the education system, particularly, for example, here in the UK, decolonizing the curriculum seems to be a very big thing that's happening so being able to be able to understand other countries and different global perspectives of how that is happening it's able to then transfer that learning that understanding maybe into your own context and to be able to understand how game-based approaches can be utilized within that um, sort of situation uh, we also do have uh, Michael's uh, presentation, uh, which is from our webinars in the 40th anniversary as well. Uh, so you can go check that out on our website as well. Um, I now want to invite Shane uh, to speak. Uh, Shane obviously co-edited the book and has written or co-authored quite a few chapters within it. Um, so I want to invite Shane to talk a little bit about his chapters and his experience with writing in the book. Shane. I'll start off with the experience of writing the book, which was really positive. All the um, worry at the start of doing an endeavour like this is, will the person that you approach contribute a chapter? And you hope to around, get around about 60, 70% of the people that you approach respond and you know, volunteer to, to give their time to the chapter that you're asking them to write. Everybody responded. And, um, you know, that... That demonstrates the the interest, but also the keenness to get the ideas out to the community. Uh, many people have messaged me, and I'm sure they have you, Alan and Linda, that they believe that this book provides an important um, update on where teaching games and sport for understanding is and brings together for the first time the global perspectives into one book so people don't have to search for the different concepts of teaching games for understanding. They're able to come to one source and get that information, which enables them, therefore, to see what the nuances are between the models that have developed since the original TGFU and start to think about, you know, which models are, as Tim Hopper said, flipping the technical to tactical to become tactical to technical, and which models are providing a unstructured, non-linear, 
um, perspective on the pathway through pedagogical decision making and which are providing a structured but non-linear pathway through pedagogical decision making for the teachers and for me that's often where the distinctiveness lies with the different models is the degree of structure and the freedom of non-linearity in um, pedagogical decision making that's that's applied to the teachers um with the own chat with the chapters that i was part of in addition to working with michael on that chapter and the one that i talked about earlier which was about how tgfu changed the focus of games and sports teaching or brought into greater consciousness a change of focus that have been talked about um, by others for a number of years as well such as Molden and Redfern uh, and in the sports domain people like Alan Wade, Eric Worthington and there would be others from a continental and European broader European perspective that um, would come into that conversation. In chapter six I work with John Williams to explain the model that I've developed called play with purpose that arose out of the questions that would come to me when I was doing my game sense workshops. When, when do we do technique? There are obviously people who are failing in their participation in the game and not getting enjoyment and not finding satisfaction in the game because their technical competency are not equivalent to their peers. So how do we go about providing a differentiated experience within a game sense approach? And there was a lot of misunderstanding of the game sense approach as just play a game even though it was quite clear in the original articulation from the Australian Sports Commission that there was still room for other pedagogy, such as direct instruction within a game sense approach. So over time, a model emerged because people said to me that I needed to lay out those ideas into a schema to help people understand the flow through a lesson that this concept of play with purpose, and purpose is the key word for me in this, is the intentionality of the teacher and the use of the game as a learning engagement that is central to the educative purpose of teaching games and sport for understanding. In that regard, therefore, I would consider that play with purpose is explicit teaching because the teacher knows what they're looking for from the game. They, as Eric Worthington wrote in his 1974 book, the advanced practitioner goes into the game knowing the moment in the game that's going to occur. And when that moment occur, they stop the game as a living blackboard and start to be able to do the analysis and inquiry with the experience of the moment. And it does take a fair understanding of games to be able to appreciate that um, games, while they're always unique and situations are uh, unique to their moments in the game, there is a familiarity to those situations. And with anticipation, we can uh, know what our players will bring and when the game will come to a, a critical point that we can stop them and reflect. That then leads us to chapter nine, where I work with Brendan Sue C, who has become one of the preeminent scholars on the teaching games for understanding intersection with a spectrum of teaching styles. Having uh, Brendan now written a couple of chapters showing that a games-based approach, whether that be from a constraints-led perspective or a game sense perspective or a TGFU perspective, is actually a cluster of teaching styles, which... Uh, brings more nuance to the descriptions of game-based approaches, which is often that they are a discovery teaching episode or a guided discovery teaching episode. In fact, when we look at the descriptions, whether they be of a constraints-led episode or a game-based episode from one of the other models, often the questions are leading to uh, retrieval of known understanding rather than guidance towards uh, discovery. And there's there's no sense in the, the the descriptions that are provided in the literature that the coach or the teacher has first of all found out what the students already know can do and understand and having parked all of that information can now direct the players towards discovery of unique understanding for the first time and brendan's been able to show that you know that's not a problem if the purpose of the teacher or the coach is to elaborate understanding in order to make the thinking visible, to get confirmation of what the players already know, do and understand, to enable better planning for where to go to next. But if the purpose is discovery, then we first of all need to make the um, thinking of the players visible in order to know what they know and can do, to challenge them to go into a different direction or the unknown. And then the other chapter I work with is with Ellen, who I'd invite to you know, provide some commentary well on this. Uh, I've been in my own coaching practice inspired by the work of Lynn Kidman on an athlete-centred approach 
and central to the descriptions in Lynn's work of an athlete-centred approach is uh, the Game Sense and TGFU uh, notion of how to go about coaching, not only in the game for the technical and tactical perspective, but as Adrian talked about earlier, there is this affective domain. You know, we emotionally experience a game. There are lessons around um, shared commitment to goals and being able to collaborate to achieve an outcome, persistence and resilience in the face of um, failure and challenge and needing to go again that build the person holistically and we can use sport as a metaphor for life to help people that are playing sport involved in our clubs grow as people as well as grow as players and an athlete-centered approach encourages to go to that first one encourages us to use the games as an opportunity to help people grow as better people because better people make better players make better clubs and ultimately that means they make better families and better communities so they're the chapters and Ellen I invite you to yeah, chip in there with your thoughts on our chapter 12. Uh, very much so. I particularly like talking about the empowerment of players and athletes in terms of looking at that athlete-centered coaching. It's not no longer the sort of listen to your coach and do exactly what they say and do that replication of the coach says and does, but that empowerment and that democracy and action coming in there that allows us to get the autonomy with players and athletes. And I think sort of one of the key points that we raise in the chapter is about making sure that this comes through our structures in policy for sport governing bodies um, to be able to sort of empower those athletes and get that uh, coming through in terms of using a game-based approach um, and using that to sort of allow us to um, ultimately make better athletes, make them feel more, uh, have a sense of belonging, have that sort of development process with uh, athlete-centered coaching. And I think that brings us quite nicely onto linking with um, equality and diversity um, chapters as well. And I want to try and bring in Kanai here for her chapter. Um, so Kanai? All right, thank you. Yes, thank you. So there's definitely that. That was I was exactly thinking that's going to nicely into our chapter. So um, let me quickly share my screen, if I may. Let's see. Hold on. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So um, let's go back. So our chapter, like is um, like Shen and uh, Ellen said. Uh, focusing on effective domain, uh, effective part of the um, uh, the learning in physical education, particularly. So we are uh, focusing on providing um, practical example of how teachers can uh, utilize um, game-based approaches to promote justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion Jedi through um, game-based approach physical education. So. Just quickly, I would like to acknowledge our team members. This was completely our team effort. So with, Ding, with Linda Griffin and then Teng Shi Sheng from um, Sandy, hold on, San, no, no, Civic Education and the Sports Teacher Academy Singapore. And the Dr. Bruce Nakala is uh, Sandy Spring Friends School uh, in, United, in the United States. And then Dr. Um, Corey Boyd is from Springfield College in the United States. And my name is Kanai Haneshi from Western Colorado University. So like I said, our chapter is um, pointed out that how it is important nowadays to uh, include, you know, physical education in teaching environment, learning environment to uh, address or promote, not just, um, Yes, uh, psychomotor domain or cognitive domain more as well, but also the effective domain, particularly about around the justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. That's because of what is going on in the society and what our student at school uh, need in this society. So then we adjust that physical education teacher is in one of the perfect uh, position, a unique position to address all sorts of things. Um, in addition to, uh, you know, exercise and fitness and motor skills, 
the, the traditional um, aspect of any physical education. So then we start, started the chapter with why we, we are using game-based approach to address this. And then the basically the games is, that's because games is a social and dynamic and public. We often see what we see, what we witness in society, in the game situation, in the smaller scale. So these are some of the examples. In game space, sometimes we see um, power dynamics between students, you know, like the, between the student with the popularity with others, or we sometimes see the girls often considered and treated as a marginalized, or um, again, like some of the things we, some of the discriminations and, um, uh, discrimination and like power differences, injustice practices we see in our society, we see in the game situation. That's why it is important. It is um, important to address JDI, JDI issues when uh, we are using the game-based approaches. So that was uh, pretty much our um, chapter. And then our chapter connected with the uh, um, sports education uh, framework as well. So slightly, but uh, uh, mainly focused on how, how to do it. So, cause you know, we have often talked about, okay, let me just stop sharing. We have often talked about like, you know, like it, it, is, it is important to adjust effective domain or, you know, in the physical education, but then that of physical education teachers understand it's important, but then they don't know how to actually do it. So like our work is very, very much focused on like, okay, this is how to do it. These are the examples. These are the example questions that you can ask at this kind of timing. So like more, so we gave some of the examples of how um, teachers can intentionally um, bring up and address that justice, equity, diversity, inclusion issues within the game teaching. In addition to teaching, of course, uh, the, the tactic, you know, important part of the tact teaching games, how to play games as well. So that's pretty much the, um, the summary of um, chapter 16. Thank you. Thank you for that, Kanai. Um, so yes, as she said, um, it is in chapter 16. Um, and just coming back to Shane's, um, his play with purpose chapter is chapter six. Um, his chapter with Brendan Susie on the spectrum of teaching styles is chapter nine and the athlete centered coaching uh, chapter that we wrote together is chapter 12. Um, I want to sort of bring this about and finalize our last speaker for today. Uh, Linda, you're going to bring up the rear uh, to tell us a little bit about your chapters. So please over to you. Thank you, Ellen. Bringing up the rear. Okay, I'll never remember that. Okay, so <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. So I have. Um, I'm going to focus on the constructivist chapter and clearly the uh, uh, tactical games model chapter. But I'll talk about the constructivist chapter. Um, I I wrote this with Jean Francois Richard from Canada and Moncton. Um, uh, I just felt when I started writing, I was like, you know, there's a really really good constructivist approach that's not written enough and sometimes forgotten. And so I, we decided, I asked him to join me and we situated the constructivist learning theory chapter within the um, tactical decision uh, learning model that comes from uh, Grahain and Gogbu and uh, Richard. Um, in fact, Richard's dissertations on the team sport assessment procedure which that's actually how we connected because of the GPAI. So what I like about this chapter that it, it takes time to explore this, this model that um, is, I, I just think that there's a lot to it. Like the three main pieces of it is the tactical, the tactical decision learning model, the TDLM, um, the team sport assessment procedure, the TSAP, which I think the richness of that is the peer assessment piece of it. It's all situated in peer assessment, which brings you to the central part of this model that truly shows a constructivist approach is around the debate of ideas. It's a cycle. 
and uh, which in which the um, the the peer assessment informs the debate, which informs the practice of the game, and so everything is situated around that, which I think really highlights the strength of that variation of the model, and all very much situates that in. Um, a constructivist approach. So that's sort of what's outlined in that chapter, uh, you know, bringing us to things that uh, draw us to other work from uh, Kirk and McPhail around communities of practice and those kinds of things that help us understand the model in just a little different way because they're starting to move away from what was the original model and think about how that could be put it into action. So that's that chapter. Um, the other chapter, the um, Steve Mitchell and I, uh, Judy's retired now, so we're going back into the early 90s. Uh, and um, the uh, tactical games model. Um, so we did a highlight version of that. And um, we have our journey, I mean, the stars aligned for us. Uh, Judy and I started, I'm going to do a share screen on this because a little bit of a um, PowerPoint that I can share. Um, so in this, um, one of the big things about has, was our journey. Our journey was, I mean, the story behind this is the stars aligned, Steve, Judy, and I were at Penn State and Judy and I had just come off trying to play with this continuum of skill-based to games-like and we started reading stuff about Bunker and Thorpe and all of that when we were at Ohio State. And then when Steve came, it sort of just finished us off and we took our trip off the deep end into a tactical games model. Cause you know, we were, how do you do this? What happens? Um, so uh, that's sort of a little bit of our story. And when we, I mean, the biggest thing about this, our story is that we wanted, we understood the model, we got it, but we feel that it was getting misinterpreted that it was just go play a game. I mean, that we all know that that's one of the myths of it. So in our simplification of the model was the idea of we want it to be doable, all right? Want to doable. And the idea of it being, this this is good practice. This is should doable. So everything is built around the idea of the model, the simplified version of the model, the games classification system. We created game frameworks uh, that, are tied to the the, the uh, games classification system, levels of tactical complexity, and went down all the way to the um, lesson cycle because we believe that if we wanted teachers to do it, we had to build it and then help them create their own. So I'm gonna stop sharing, but sort of that's the theory behind it. Oh, I, will, I guess I will share again because the other piece of that we wanted to finish that it was similar to uh, Grahane and. Um, Bagbu and all those folks is that we uh, really felt that if you're going to um, teach something, you need to measure it. Uh, so that's how um, the GPII came about. So I'll share screen again. Um, so Again, we wanted something that was adjustable and it has flaws, no question about it. It started as a research instrument, very technical. And then we, we had moved it to be a little bit more uh, friendly. So we built this around the idea that if we used all these components, we could build little instruments to measure gameplay on the components being taught within the game because we felt like most, uh, most um, assessments were out of context. And this put everything in context. Uh, so that's how the, the uh, GPI, GPAI came about. Um, one of the things that's a criticism of the this model, which, which is fair, is that we kind of oversimplified it. Um, but we also believe strongly that the teaching is direct. All teaching is direct. Uh, and this was our belief, and that we are the architects. Now we can be indirect on how we want students to explore the content, but we believed that we had to provide a framework for the, the, the teacher had to have the plan in order for the game to break down, in order for the person, to, the teacher to respond as a facilitator. So that became the teacher as architect became the way we kept thinking about that, even though we were 
throwing out game conditions and questions. And we embraced all the other aspects of the model, but we wanted to, and we know the questions are the central feature to have that discussion, but that discussion can't happen if the teacher isn't thinking about how to build those games to ask the questions that are really gonna show the exaggeration of the game that you're trying to focus on or the part of the game that you're kind of try, trying to focus on. Because that takes that takes thought and time. You just don't respond on the spot unless you've had, you know, millions of years, you're Rod Thorpe on the court, you know, that kind of thing. So it was a way of getting teachers to feel like it was actually something they could do in classrooms, even with the constraints of space, all the things that Adrian brought up, which I think are very fair. So that's how we got to that. And so that's what that chapter is about, kind of a summary of that, of work of oh, almost 34 years. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for that, Linda. Um, so um, we've just got a couple more minutes left and I just want to see if anyone has any questions they would like to ask. Um, I've noticed Yogesh, you've got put something. So the TGFU model prioritizes game-based activities and understanding game strategies over the development of specific technical skills. While this approach can enhance game intelligence and decision-making, it may not be as effective in developing individual techniques or mastering specific. Can we add additional steps for mastering game skills? Uh, does anyone want to sort of answer that or think about it? I can, I mean, I'd like to respond to that because I had, I had to come to terms with that. To, with that. Um, being a former volleyball coach and like taking my life back to sport pedagogy when I did my doctoral work. I mean, I used to be so insistent when I was a player that, I mean, when I was a coach that when you had a four on pass volleyball, serve, receive, dig or whatever, there was a specific way to do it. And there is mastering skills. And I absolutely agree with you. But I kept thinking to myself, we're not getting students to appreciate the need to or uh, taking the time to do that if we don't give them a chance to understand, to make their, to make their game work in, in the skills they have and then move them to the next level. Because I do think we have to, I agree that it has to be built in and I'm not quite sure where that goes but it is something that needs to be looked at. But I also kept thinking, if they're not even interested in playing the game, then their mastery doesn't matter at that point. But that's also has to do with a lot of how much time we have in PE. And I think that's where sport can come in. Uh, the coaching of sport can come in in, a, in another way. Shane, add, add, go ahead. Yeah, I'm not sure that it reprioritizes or prioritizes the technical over the tactical. I mean, the technical is there in the six steps of the TGFU model. I tend to agree with Tim Hopper, who described TGFU as reordering the common progression of technical, sorry, yeah, technical to tactical drills preceding games. And it was a reordering of the sequence from game appreciation leading to the technical but the technical is still there in the six steps it's it's not ignored it's not reprioritized it's repositioned in the order of teaching now other models do it differently in the game sense approach for example it was emphasized that you watch the game you see if technical work needs to be developed and if it's the most appropriate way to address any technical needs you would um, stop the game and go into a, an alternative task and then to check whether that task has actually uh, made a difference you need to go back into the game to test its effect and and who it's been effective for so I think this is one of the uh, myths or as our colleague John Williams would describe in figurational sociology you know, more of an everyday philosophy from a naive understanding of what games-based approaches are rather than what the game-based approaches themselves say about themselves in the literature. Thank you for those responses, you two. Um, Gavin, I see your hand up. Hi, thank you. Um, I've just, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm really excited about uh, looking at the, reading the book and um, 
uh, but I haven't yet, so I can't comment yet on the book. But what I wanted to ask about is I've just finished delivering a, uh, a module for university students on teaching games to understanding. It's the kind of first time I've, I've done it, so I've probably still got much to learn and a lot of takeaways from it. But it seems it seems important that if you are going to use this uh, model or game space model, that well, content knowledge is really important. And that's that's hard to do quickly for, for someone. So how do we equip um, aspiring um, phys physical educators, teachers, coaches with the ability to use a model, a game space, a model before they potentially have the uh, the content knowledge? Is there is there a way of fast tracking? What's the what's the way of doing that? Well, um you might argue artificial intelligence might be able to help you. <laughs> I'm being serious actually about that. My understanding is is that in a in a day now they're talking about um, basically going from zero to a, to a hundred percent. So, um, uh, yeah, to some extent, I, I think that might be an element to it. Um, Phil Ward has written a lot about the importance of content knowledge and, and pedagogical content knowledge um, and, the, and the, dif um, the difficulties that initial level teachers have with that. Um, there's a lot of, he, he believes a lot in sort of, um, I'll use the wrong term here, sort of not a, learn, not a knowledge tree, but it's um, around that, that sort of notion to try and help students. But one of the reasons why they, they prefer, and this goes back to the previous question as well, one of the reasons why they prefer very often to, to teach in a technique type manner is because it's way easier to control. Um, the variables are much easier to um, uh, manipulate. Um, whereas when you're dealing with a, a game, even a simplified game, you're dealing with all the various elements to that. And if you put a series of small sided games, this is based on my experience, but also some work as well. Um, if you put uh, teachers in a initial level teachers in a position where they're trying to look at a series of small sided games and either diagnose individual or overall concerns or weaknesses or things to work on in those games, they'll really struggle to do that. The game is a complicated environment. Um, it can be made simpler, of course, uh, and, and masterful teachers are able to do that, but it's a lot for them to focus in on. So I don't think at the moment, in spite of, in spite of AI, there's a, a simple answer to it. Um, it, it takes time uh, and, and you've got to develop your, your expertise and your knowledge. The great thing, of course, today is that the, the web provides information, not all of it good, I know, on everything. And, and that also can facilitate. I mean, I, I think, you know, when I was an undergraduate going to learn something, you had to go to a library and find a book on it. Now you've got information at your fingertips. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you for that, Adrian. Um, I've noticed we've got a question in the chat from Farihan and Michael has said he'll answer it. So, uh, Michael. Sure. Um, thanks, Farihan, for the question. I, coming from a sports science background, I thought I might be happy to speak to this. So, actually, my um, my honours project, which was in Australian rules football, looked at from a strength and conditioning perspective to the game sense approach, specifically looking at agility demands, um, but there can obviously be others as well. There's a paper that comes to mind that I can't remember the author, but I will pass it on to Alan when I find it. And I'm um, Alan will probably be able to pass it on to you, is that um, it's been able to understand, for example, we think of small-sided games being knowing how the different formats of those games have different demands so for example a larger playing space allows for greater movement patterns to occur however maybe less skill opportunities um, but that might be opportunities for players to reach greater running speed so that's going to be a higher demand there from a aerobic capacity compared to if we have a higher density so more players in a smaller playing area greater opportunities for more movements and, and more skill opportunities. Um, but if we're thinking from a aerobic perspective, that's going to be reduced. So I think it's knowing your sport that you're engaging with and then thinking about the different skill components that you're looking to target um, 
and then playing around with that over time. So, um, yeah, there's a useful article that I, that I have to mind that I'm happy to pass on that does sort of unpack that from an aerobic anaerobic because there is that demand, as you mentioned, if we're thinking that from an athlete perspective and being able to plan for that across in season and off season is really important um, because it does demand um, much more than just your, you know, your skills and techniques, um, ta techniques and all that sort of thing. So um, yeah, really good question and something that does need to be considered. Thank you Hopefully for that. Right that for you. Thank you. And uh, when Michael passes on the article, I can pass it on to you, Farihan, as well. Um, I think it's sort of we've gone over time, so I want to sort of wrap up um, and just say thank you all so much uh, for coming today. Uh, thank you to my different speakers uh, for contributing both to the chapters of the book and also for being here today to be able to talk a little bit about your chapters. Um, all of this has been fantastic. The recording will be made available on our website and I will speak to uh, speakers to get their slides through as well. Um, thank you all for coming and we look forward to you at the next event. See you later. Thank you, Alan. Thank you.